Reverend Mary J. Lige. Responsibility. It felt it felt necessary to me. It felt like uh, something I, I couldn't not do. Um, so I knew that those six voices uh, that was really the trick of the book. And the chapter of the, uh, every chapter of the book belongs to one of the six characters. Um, Pappy is the only character who is not assigned uh, chapters. And um, I knew that that was the trick. I knew that that absolutely had to um, be part of the film because uh, that was the thing. It sort of made it. Feel, it gave it this illusion of being kinetic. It sort of made it feel like a Twitter feed. Like, like it, felt, it made it feel like to, to Kill a Mockingbird for this generation. So, um, uh, you know, then I sort of tricked Sally Jo Ethenson into paying me to, to, to write the script. Um, uh, because she, she uh, you know, I, I had to take, um, you know, at, at that early stage, uh, bringing those six voices to life was a, a process that occurred in stages. You know, and for my early par uh, part, I knew that I sort of had to write certain things. So when I was in Jamie's point of view, for instance, I, you know, I was trying to write to uh, cold and wet and exterior nights. And when it was Ronsel, it was claustrophobic, <coughs> and sweaty. When it was Florence or, or Hap, there was sunlight. And uh, when it was Hap, I made start a line of prose with high and wide. But again, these were just seeds. These were just little, little, little tiny seeds that, 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 that I was able to plant that later on, um, some geniuses were able to harvest. Huh. <laughs> Definitely down for, down for our actors, uh, Mary, Jason, Rob, Gary. Um, what, what, what about the script, when you read the script, what made you say yes to, to the project? What stood out to you? What stood out for me is um, in scripts like this, Love doesn't ever get, you, you can't really ever see love as the silver lining. And I just saw love as the silver lining, no matter how bad it got, you know, no matter how bad they were tortured or disrespected, you know, the um, Jackson family or whatever, um, Jamie and Ronzel went through, you, I mean, um, what we are dealing with together, you saw so much love in their friendship, you saw so much love just through the whole thing. And it was so much darkness and blood and, you know, it was so much, you know, negativity, but you can see the love in it. Right. And that's that's what really drew me to the script. And the fact that, you know, it was pretty close to where we were headed in, 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 in our real lives. And Florence, of course, because Florence is definitely my grandmother and my aunts. And so that character was always relative to me. And that's what drew me, just basically how love actually saved the day and love doesn't save the day. These types of for me, it was the ambition of the script. You know, I think as, as, as pointed out, it was you know six characters, six lead characters. You never read that in a script. I read a lot of scripts, and and, and the, the generational time span. Which was, this is a monster of a movie. It was reaching so high and so far. Um, you know, I had to meet this woman that was behind it. It was Dee, and and and, and then you know she seemed to talk and know that this this 
far-reaching, you know, script and size and epic story could how it could be done, and, and that was what struck me, and that's what stuck me from day one right to the very end. To even here we are today, that she's achieved it. You don't see that ever, ever. Six lead characters in one movie. You know, I think it's extraordinary to pull it off and told such a narrative. Uh, for me, <clears throat> when I read it for the first time, I mean, I've always romanticized about this area. And I've worked in certain films where it's about the 40s, and I have this love for it. But this era, in, in general, in the South, in this time period, sort of post World War II, um, you know, uh, sharecropping time. But it was almost kind of unfair when I read it for the first time because I empathized with Jamie's character so much. The, the, the beginning version of Jamie before he took off to war, because I grew up on a farm in northern Minnesota with my father and my brother. I had an older brother that treated me very much like <laughs> Jason's character in front of me, you know, physically and emotionally. And now that's what he does. He makes up for it by rubbing my knee, actually. Uh -huh. um, um, uh, and, and, you know, father, and, and also I never really wanted to take after the farm, and so I'd had a lot of personalization within that. And also, um, growing up on the farm, uh, the, both my grandfathers were in the war and, and my father was in the army. And so that was something um, that I related to greatly and I'd heard a lot of stories from my grandfather. Uh, one more about his experience in the war because he wasn't on the front line and then there's like that kind of version of Jamie that doesn't want to speak about what he'd seen and the trauma that he'd experienced because my other grandfather that was on the front line was um, he was uh, uh, an MP in in, um, in Japan and the stuff that he saw he never spoke about and he came back to the farm and he had eight kids and, and the time that he dwelled on kind of his experiences weren't with like somebody in a barn that he could share with or about the booze it was by himself in the tractor and just kind of this this whole world I mean it just um, it felt very close to me um, I then and ultimately I, I really wanted to work with Dee as well like Jason said I, I got on with her and I heard what she had to say and I'd express kind of my life and what I went through, and we said, "All right, let's go." And and you know, it was it was a lot of that. It was, it was very close to home, and there was also a lot of it because I grew up in the far north, so there was a lot that I didn't know. So it was experiencing uh, a side of the states and in this era that I hadn't uh, been a part of, and it was truly a, a journey to be a part of this one and to see how, you know, the the flip side. <clears throat> for like the Jackson family, for getting to witness the, all of these wonderful actors portraying, you know, the Jacksons as well was a, was a side that I wasn't familiar with growing up and it, it really gave me an insight to a history that I hadn't really known. So uh, yeah, that's very much that. Right. Um, yeah, for me it was uh, to reunite with D. Reeves again because we had did Pariah before. Um, that was successful, so I knew just to rock with you again would be a, a beautiful opportunity. Um, read the script, I thought it was, was beautiful as far as how it portrayed uh, Florence and Hap Jackson's relationship, because we rarely see that in, in cinema. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt that uh, it was necessary to give voice to the voices like that, and right. especially uh, that family is pretty much the fabric of America, right. but they never get credit for it. Right. So I, I really felt um, that uh, it was my responsibility to be just as, as honest and pure as I can to, to, to give Hap Jackson that voice for the millions of brothers and sisters out there that hasn't had the opportunity to be heard. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was my yeah. What was that initial conversation like between you and Dee in terms of the approach you all wanted to take to, to capturing this story? Um, I think we started by exchanging visual references. She sent me some of the things that inspired her, um, <clears throat> ranging from a documentarian called Les Blank to a fine art photographer, I mean, fine art uh, artist, portrait artist in Whitfield Lavelle. And, um, and I sent back a ton of references from like Farm Security Administration Photography. Um, and we just sort of talked about the look and feel and tone of the film. Um, it was, it was uh, 
I think one to be very careful not to glorify the era. I think oftentimes with period films, you sort of see the golden age of X, Y, or Z, and everything is sort of meant to look better than it actually you know, was. And, and I think we really wanted to make it feel authentic and to kind of contrast you know, the American dream with the American reality. So you've got moments of beauty and hope, and then other moments of, of harsh and grit. And then to, to that same kind of point, Angie, in terms of the approach for the makeup, there there is makeup, I would assume. There is plenty of makeup. But it's, but it's, it's, it's minimal. It doesn't, it doesn't look like many of the characters have makeup. So how did you all go about achieving that? Um, there's actually a way to put on makeup that makes it look like there is no makeup. <laughs> Let me just say that Mary is like an absolutely beautiful woman. I had to kind of work to take her to Florence. So, you know, people, I'm serious, because she's, she's really gorgeous, and I, had, I took some of the highlighting out of her skin. I mean, these are things that I did that made Florence look like someone who was an attractive woman, but a woman who was living a life that was not glamorous. Right. And so what we did was we added broken blood vessels, we blotched skin colors on <laughs> Carrie, um, you know, we darkened people under the eyes. Um, we didn't have people shave, there was no concealer. Um, there were, uh, eyebrows were sort of covered over with a little foundation to make them look like they weren't arched. I mean, there, there was plenty of makeup. So, and, uh, and we did some gross stuff too, which is my, my favorite, I love the gross stuff. <laughs> I love it. Um, and so how was that for you, Mary? Taking off Mary J and putting on Lawrence. <laughs> Uh, the first two days, it was a struggle. <laughs> it was a struggle. I just couldn't understand how Florence wasn't born with lashes. Not in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't Florence born with lashes. Like I was really trying to get, you know, I didn't even know I was hanging on to these things. Like, like this movie really like liberated me and fixed me because I didn't know I was hanging on to so many things to, to make me feel secure. And I was like, D, can she have a wavy wig? Like, <laughs> and, 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 huh? I wanted Florence to be cute and Indian, you know? Uh -huh. huh? And, and like, you know? <laughs> so I, I was struggling, but by the third day, I was running from trail to trail with my own hair, full afro, yeah. just always free. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. And what I really appreciated is I appreciated the fact that I had two actresses who put a story before their pride about the way they look, which really speaks so highly of their talent and their respect for the art. And I just want to say thank you for letting us make it look real to all of you, because I didn't get to make anybody look too pretty, except for Mr. Handsome over there. <laughs> <laughs> we had some struggles with a mustache. And oh my God, the mustache. Trying to keep a mustache glued on to your face. Oh, so it's the seventh degrees. character in the film. Mustache was the seventh character. It's <laughs> a living hell. <laughs> Virgil, the, the movie makes use of a lot of like internal monologues. There's a lot of voiceovers that we hear for all of the, the six characters. Um, was that something that was present in, in the book? Um, or something that you, you all added to the, to the story? No, it, it was absolutely present in the book. It's what helps, uh, it's, it's one of the things that really helps delineate uh, each of the voices, because each of those voices is unique. Mm -hmm. um, so there were entire, I mean, look, Hillary Jordan wrote an American masterpiece. Right. Um, and that's, yeah. that's, my, that's my homie now, too, so like, I have to give her some props, because she really wrote, I mean, that book is astounding, and there were whole swaths of dialogue that, 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 that I could take from the book and, and put into the screenplay and build around. Mm -hmm. So there was like these giant, uh, these giant columns that you could build a, build a scenes and story around. Nice. Rob, you mentioned kind of the, the fact that we don't see the, the, the story of the Jacksons often told. Um, for you and Mary, talk about getting into that place. I know Dee has what some are calling kind of an <laughs> unconventional way of getting y'all into character, into viewing characters. Yeah, we had the uh, the eye connecting exercises 
like the very first time we saw each other, she brings us into this room and sets a chair over there and sets my chair here, and Mary's there and I'm here and we just gotta look at each other and dive in and channel in. And, you know, that was all helpful for, for the process once they set action for us to connect that way. And I think what the first thing I said was, there's, there's my woman. <laughs> and unfortunately, I had just I just got off a plane. I just came back from a bad word reunion concert. I was all the way married to Blige. I didn't even know who Florence. I knew Florence from the script, but I was not ready to be Florence yet. <laughs> so I come through the door, this fresh raw, not even knowing who he is, and he jumps on me going, "There's my woman." <laughs> <laughs> day trying to act with him. <laughs> and then, you know, once I gave in, it was all, all right. <laughs> yeah, because, well, you know, and I'm glad she brought that up, because I was like, man, you mean, you mean to tell me she was just on stage last night, and now she's going to come and be in this little tight room with me? This is going to be crazy. You know? <laughs> and, so, and, and, and off the bat, we just set the, ten, you know, set the love and, and the community that we had for each other right there in that room, and it just carried over on the screen, I think. Jason and Garrett, talk about the, the relationship between your two characters. They're, they're brothers. One is, it seems to be, um, to have a better relationship with the father, and they're navigating that. How did you two kind of access those particular points for you? Well, I mean, I, I always thought that, I mean, are you carry? The writing was very good. I, I always thought that if I, if I could find the connection between Henry and Jamie, that I mean, that deep love. At the end of the day, it's deep love. And I think Pappy has deep love for Jamie as well. I mean, that's the heart of that relationship. I think it's deep in the book. But if, if that was there, then a lot would flow from that. You know, I mean, he says at the end of the day, at the beginning of the film, he never thought he would betray his brother. You know, and, and it's, it's central to both of our, you know, both of our separate narratives, I thought. And so, we road tripped. We we flew into uh, Memphis. Yeah, <laughs> we flew to Memphis. We got a Nissan Pajero. <laughs> no, but also because in the in the book, there's a little bit more to, uh, uh, like talking about the narratives and, and the individual perspectives of everything. I got a big understanding because I've read the script first, and it wasn't necessarily in there. To when you read Henry's. Um, the voice of um, how he's feeling either about Laura or Jamie and stuff like that. There's a lot of compassion that's revealed that wasn't necessarily put out in the script. And when you read the book, I got to see how Henry actually felt about the younger brother, which was very nice. And that was something for us to play with. Um, Jason and I had met, you know, a few times here and there. And, and but we did this trip and, and we went from Memphis to New Orleans. We only had about a week before shooting, uh, so what they did like Greenville and all the places where they that we could find. So we went to like um, Greenville, Mississippi, and we stayed in this little, it's like a little compound of 1920s cabins, a little place called Tallahassee Flats, and we sort of just sat there. And both of us we were working with the same guy, the, the infamous Tim Monarch for dialect. So we were kind of he given us tapes of these old men and the Delta at this time that he interviewed so that was helpful and just to sort of do that road trip and bond on a bill um you know on the road and, and look at some whiz tunes and, and listening to a lot of, of country tunes together sent by the bonfire and sort of knowing that you know getting an understanding of where both of us were within what we wanted within the characters what we wanted within the film and expected of the film or our hopes of just what we could do together to um <coughs> Uh, elevate our performances or our relationship to make that uh, radiate, and that was the most important thing. Yeah. Rachel and Andrea, I'm told that there were a lot of elements at play. Um, rain and mud, and it's the South, y'all are filming in Louisiana, so it's, I know it's hot. Um, how did that impact the, the filming process for both of you? Um, I mean, oh God, we, we, when we originally were going to shoot this, it was going to be January, and then, you know, it took these guys long enough to sign on that uh, by, the time, by the time we shot it was July, and, you know, that's hot as hell in the summer, 
So, and as you can see, there were no windows. We couldn't air condition things even if we wanted to. So at some point it was so hot that we actually had to shift the whole schedule into splits because we couldn't, physically we couldn't do 12 hours during the daytime. So that's a, like this one example, but you know, the rain, every, it was so hard to keep any kind of continuity in the south in the summer because it starts out sunny and within two hours you can't find the sun through the crop clouds and then it's you know pouring rain and 20 minutes later it's sunny again. <laughs> so that was the challenge for me, the biggest challenge for Angie. I'm sure there was a whole hell of a lot of other things. I think the biggest challenge for us was sweat and humidity um, and Jamie's mustache. <laughs> 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 Which by the way we had three of, I mean, we had to groom them every night. We had we went through three every day. Um, and we'd have to go back and take them and you have to set them and you know curl them and recolor them because there was rain and there was sweat and there were mosquitoes and there was just a whole lot going on. But um, it was the, the heat and humidity, but they have, there are you know lots of waterproof things you can use now and um, we managed, you know. We had patient actors who, Poor Garrett, I swear to God, I think we had to apply that mustache like 20 times. <laughs> and he always would just sit and we get it on there and, and we go back it out. Bit, and, you miss it just a little bit. Uh, actually, Garrett was horrible in the present, but now in the I, I sent you a text with a photo of it actually a few months ago, just she one day out of the still blue. Has it. I, I, I do have it. Yeah, because you never know when you're going to have to like relive your nightmare. So, <laughs> But talking about the heat and the oppressive conditions and all that, as hot as it was, I loved it as, a, as the actor because I understood that Hap Jackson, he didn't have AC. He didn't have a chance to just sit in the cooling tent. You know, so I would literally have the AC off in my hotel room. I didn't sit in the cooling tents. You know, he was out there in the elements. And as, as oppressive as it was, it informed our characters so much more that we had to be honest. To respect that part. And that was like the eighth character of the film, the environment. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, you know, but uh, I don't know, when you when you got good material to play and, and it's and it's and it's right there written for you well, and all you gotta do is just live in it and be it, that stuff is, is beautiful for me, man. We love that shit. <laughs> Could y'all talk a little bit about, y'all dealt with, the movie deals with some very serious issues. Um, in, in turn, and there's a number of scenes that are, are um, I don't know if it was for you all, but it's hard for me to watch. Yeah. Um, so I'm imagining it was hard for you all to, to film. Uh, could y'all talk a little bit about how you went about just kind of the, the set environment while you're dealing with, you know, all these very serious, real issues for a lot of people? Yeah, well, that's what I mean. You know, in particular, like if we if we go back to the barn scene, I think because Jason and I had formed um, Jason Mitchell, we formed such a sort of a supportive bond from the get go, and so all these scenes with us having camaraderie and, and becoming the brothers without the blood, um, we supported each other and, and made sure each other was okay. So when it came to the scene, we both knew what we were getting into. We read the script read the book, we knew what we were filming. So I think the most difficult part about that scene was feeling the tension in the room about everybody not, you know, the unpredictability of, of everybody not knowing what was gonna happen between all of us because D gave such freedom to roam around and use the space. And like even in scenes where Jason and I are fighting, like it, she didn't care if we were both swinging at each other. We didn't. Um, choreograph exactly what we were going to do, so we didn't really, you know, know, and so the, thus the crew didn't know, and so you felt the tension in the barn scene big time because of, you know, you're surrounded by everybody in the hoods, and that's already like people that's getting under people's skin, and having to see Ronzel up there and and what Angie had, you know, made him look like, and that was very painful for everybody to see, and we didn't rehearse the scenes, and so we just walked in and just and went, and so the crew, I think, was kind of on the edge of their seat, and you could feel that tension, and it was, it was, it was very, 
you know, it's like oh, if a cat feels your stress, they're about to throw up. You can feel the crew is always kind of on the borderline of that. Mary, your character, find, you find Jason and just character Ronzel um, after that particular scene. How was that for you? Um, it was heavy because, I mean, although it was makeup and everything like that, we were really in a barn. We were really on a plantation. We were, I was really feeling, you know, and I, and I made like, like a real connection with my son. You know, I touched him and put my hands on him. And he's so sensitive as a man, like he really makes you feel for him. And just finding him, like, like, like everything that I was dealing with, like personally, it just was the perfect place for me to, I hate to use the word, vomit it all up, you know, to find my son like that. And it was, it was like I was living through my own, and my, my own ancestors, like we were all living whatever, whatever, whatever pain they felt. That's, that's how it was for me. And then for you, for you, uh, Rachel, the filming of that scene in, in particular, how, what was the conversation in terms of what you all wanted to be sure to achieve out, out of that, since it's kind of near the end of the movie, but it's also kind of a, a very big climax moment? I mean, I, I think just the, the tension that, that these guys express, you know, I, I think it was meant to be uncomfortable. I don't think we want it to be in your face graphic. I, I think we we're trying to find the most tasteful way to tell a very uh, emotionally challenging scene um, and to really, you know, live in people's eyes and not in the graphic nature of, you know, cuts or blood or, you know, specifics. Um, we we're trying to trying to be tasteful, but at the same time, you know, things like fire, you know, the flicker of fire, instantly breathes attention. And a, you know, there's a, um, and you know, I hate to say, but like, uh, it just height, heightens the stakes. I mean, I think we really wanted as high as emotional stakes as we could get without uh, making you turn away. I mean, for me, just in terms of the graphic nature, there's more in the the knee bone than in that scene because we all, I mean, we can relate to the, that scene so so inherently. Uh, this is our last question. Uh, maybe for everyone, we're going to start with Virgil and work our way down. Um, the film has kind of come out at this really interesting moment, and it seems to be very relevant, I think, for the times we're living in. What do you think is, is the message or the, or the, the, the takeaway audience should, audiences should be having? Uh, my, bound is, um, my bound is me. My bound is you. My bound is you. My bound is all of us. Because we're all stuck here on earth together, uh, bound by the mud of hate, fear, and ignorance. And the only way out is together and with love. I think for me, um, the, definitely love is the most powerful message of the film, but also that there is a strength, and I'm, you know, I'm just gonna say there's a strength in my people. And we have lived through some really tough stuff, and we keep going, and we're not filled with hatred. You know, not as a whole. There's, there are plenty of people who are still out here willing to face the world with their arms open, as there are people of all races. And so, yes, we are in this world together, and we do need to just, you know, get together and not, not let silly differences separate us. I mean, I completely agree with both of these guys. Um, you know, when we made the film, I think we, we, we knew it was timeless. I don't think we realized just how timely it would be. And I think for me, if there's any takeaway, it's, you know, to look at just how little has changed in 70 plus years and pray to fucking God that it's not like that in another 10 years. Yeah, I agree with everything they said in the years. <laughs> I mean, just for us to even be like comparing this movie to today's time shows just how much further we have to go as a, as a society. And then at the end of the, the day, love prevails. So the same, um, I think the most interesting part is you get to, I mean, it's a very intimate story and you're witnessing two families um, uh, in their own rights that are so full of broken pieces 
helping each other put each other back together constantly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, no bond is stronger than that love. And you're watching two families that love each other so much, no matter the divide or anything, it's, you're watching them in all their, uh, their troubles and trials, trying to keep their love and their family alive. And that's, again, no, no bond is stronger than that love. You know, it's a, it's a movie. I mean, I, I also think that um, what works is that, is that our art form, what we have given as a group, as a people, this is our contribution, you know, and the fact that it's relevant, as we've said, is, is sad and, and, you know, and, and, you know, beneficial for the film that people, but the, the ultimately struggle for education and compassion never ends. And I don't think we should expect it to end. I think people have fought a lot to bring it, and I think us, our role as filmmakers and as actors and writers and musicians and everybody as a group is to keep contributing to that narrative. I think film doesn't just have to be entertainment. And I'm super proud of this group of people that we have, you know, given what we're given to say what we want to say, that, you know, stand up and be counted continually. Don't just think people are going to do it for you. Um, for me, and I can say this because I'm really being tortured right now in my life, um, no matter how bad people torture you or mistreat you, Hold on to you, hold on to who you really truly are, and that is love. We are love, and that's the only way we're gonna escape or survive when we're people are trying to deliberately just destroy us. And that's the only way we'll be able to even pray for our enemies as well. That's that's what it is for me. Just a learn like learning how to pray for our enemies <coughs> and never not lose ourselves in the midst of all this hate. <laughs> Thank you.